So I first heard about The Crown when I was directing Wallander for Left Bank Productions and Andy Harris, the producer, said that they were putting together a team and that there was one, uh, splay, one space left for a director and I guess that's, so that was my introduction into meeting the, the team on The Crown and Peter Morgan, Stephen Daldry and, and Andy Harris. I think everyone thinks they know a little bit about the royal family, but the beauty of this project is nobody knows anything about them. And so every, um, every for, for me, it was a huge, huge learning curve. And certainly, I mean, my, my historical knowledge in terms of my own experience really starts around the sort of 80s so I'm you know we were dealing in uh, you know 40s 50s and so the only thing I remember from that was doing history GCSE um, but fortunately there's a there's a huge team around on hand to, to help with that there is an extensive research team that uh, presents directors with a wealth of information uh, historical information, whether that be biographies, whether that be archive footage. So my job to begin with was to to completely immerse myself in that historical research and then working in tandem with Peter and the scripts is to find where we can bring some of that um, historical research and start to colour the, the, the scripts that we're working on. I'm not sure of any restrictions that were imposed on us making the crown I, 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 and I mean that in a, in a sense that we were you know we were developing the scripts and then my job is to is to work with my collaborators and whether that be the sort of heads of department or with the actors is to find the truth in these scenes so at some at some point the scripts get handed over and it's our my duty to sort of find the, the truth in those scenes so in many ways, we're, we're talking about, the, like anything in drama, you're trying to find the things that are relatable, the things that, you know, at its heart, this is probably a sort of the greatest coming-of-age story ever, and it has, um, you know, lots of relatable things to do with in terms of family. So, so I didn't feel at any point restricted, in, in actually in many ways, I felt very unrestricted. Um, there was a there was a huge amount of freedom given to us from Netflix. I mean, essentially, they just said, they basically give us the money and then step back and said, you know, we don't know anything about the subject, and you, you know, we've hired you guys because you know about it, and and so the best thing we can do is is to leave you and, and get on and make make your films. And thankfully, over two seasons, that has. Um, has continued and they're incredibly supportive. I think if we were making this drama for BBC or ITV or a British terrestrial channel, there could be certain restrictions put on the making of the show because of relationships that those broadcasters have with the royal family and not wanting to upset that. So even though there are many people that feel that this show should be on the BBC and there is a chance it may still go on the BBC after the license for Netflix comes up. Um, in a way, we were given freedom by making the show for Netflix. And I, I think in, a, in an ironic way, I think the show is probably more truthful because of that and there weren't restrictions put on there by broadcasters. Though, uh, in terms of difficulties and that we faced in the filming of The Crown. There are a couple of examples. One, we were up in Scotland and we were filming scenes for Balmoral. And the difficulty with filming up in Scotland is the weather is quite changeable. So we, would, we, we were shooting a scene that sadly actually never even made the final film. Uh, and it was with the Queen and with uh, Lord Porchester. And they were out walking in Balmoral Estate. And within five minutes, there were four seasons that came through. We had snow, we had uh, hail, we had rain, and we had sunshine. So as a director, you, uh, you were faced with um, the challenge of how do you complete a scene when you've started the scene in snow and then it ends in sunshine and, and you have to do more coverage on that. And so we were waiting for the various different weather conditions to come through. So I think we shot that scene in three different weather conditions, snow, sunshine and rain, um, which pretty much took most of the day. And, and, then, and, then, and then the sad thing was we sort of came out to the, you know, into, the, into the cutting room and we felt that scene wasn't working in the way, n nothing to do with how it was filmed, but that we just felt that story wasn't quite working for the film, so sadly that ended up on, on the cutting room floor. Um, 
Another example is we sometimes have to do some filming on the Mall, and so to take over the the whole of the Mall uh, is a is a huge Herculean uh, effort by all the production. So we sort of head down there on an early Sunday morning and and um, start filming at sort of six o'clock in the morning, and then by about ten o'clock when uh, tourists start turning up, we sort of have to down cameras. So those 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 are the sort of big set piece shoots that involve huge military planning and real um, focus on in terms of the the shots and 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 the scene that you're shooting um, uh, so those not necessarily more of a challenge for me but certainly for the team I work with though those are big big challenges I, I, I'm proudest of two I mean I'm proud of all, all the episodes I've done in the crown the, the two that really stand out is the one in in season one which is assassins which is the is the episode where Graham Sutherland uh, an artist um, turns up to paint uh, Churchill's portrait and he famously um, dislikes it and ends up having it burnt um, that that for me was a <sighs> A, one, a wonderful opportunity to have two fantastic actors, John Lithgow, Stephen Delane, uh, in a room together, um, real powerhouses of acting, with an un unbelievable script by Peter, who I think was really writing it at its heart. And sometimes in, in The Crown, we, you know, we do the sort of the big showy set pieces, but ultimately sometimes the heart of it can really exist in just two people having a conversation and exploring in that instance, the the loss of a of a of a child that they both connected over, and my second or, or equal favourite, which I think in, a, in an odd way are sort of companion pieces, um, both use both sort of have artists or <coughs> photographers at its at its heart is Beryl, which is in season two, which is the sort of love story where um, Princess Margaret meets Tony Armstrong Jones, who then becomes uh, Lord Snowden, and that was my <coughs> attempt at a, uh, a sort of French new wave um, uh, film uh, which which was thankfully outside of the palace that we so we could sort of break that the sort of the the language of what was maybe associated with the crown and could represent uh, the sort of the, the beginning of a new decade uh, so the sort of the beginning of the sort of the, the, the 60s and how do we do that through the eyes of Margaret and Tony and one of my favorite films uh, and an Antonioni film blow up was a huge reference in that and so um, it was for me a kind of a love letter to some of those films from the 60s that I was able to sort of bring into into that episode as a director I, I think the key to collaborating with actors is to understand what you're asking your actors to do and I would advise any director who is thinking about making drama or film is to spend some time training as an actor. Now that doesn't have to be three years at drama college. I think there are courses you can do. You can do a day course, you can do a week's course, because I think that what, you're, what that will give you is an understanding of um, what you are actually ask, asking these actors to do in scenes. And I think you as a director need to know that before asking them to do that. I think secondly to that is, and once you know that, I think then you are in many ways able to play more with actors and I and I think that the for me the one of the the key the key to successful directing is to give your actors a permission to fail and that means about creating an environment of trust and to allow and to be open to a um, to be surprised when directing scenes so by all means come prepared and have a real idea about what the scene is but but then be prepared and I know people say this but be prepared to sort of ripple that up and and for them to show you something that maybe you hadn't quite visualized uh, survival tips for directors I, I think trust your collaborators I, I, you know essentially you are every time you start a new project you are building your business you are hiring all your key heads of department and so take your time hiring those people make sure that those people want to work with you and that you want to work with them and you trust them and uh, understand that they may have more experience than you and that sometimes you know it's important to, to 
be open to listening to that and, and taking that on board. I, I think as a director, you are a huge filter and lots of ideas can come through you and ultimately you need to decide which ones work for your film and, and which ones, you know, not necessarily bad ideas, but don't sort of fit into the overall DNA of the, the film that you're making. Um, I also think that uh, don't, don't get too caught up in the film that you want to be making now or in five or ten years time focus on the job that you are doing and make it the best it possibly can because that's that is the work that people will look at and will give you the next job and and so don't don't um inside obviously harbor that desire to go and make your big sort of feature film but before that moment happens and there might be a lot of steps that take you to that moment just keep just make sure that every job you do is the best it could be